Good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Reeves, and I'm a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. DEI is playing a much, much larger role in our lives and our interactions at work, school, the community, and at each realtor association level, which includes local, state, and national. To challenge ourselves to be better, CAR is committed to bringing influential speakers to broaden our mindset and change the way that we think and approach issues and situations. We encourage you to listen, ask questions, and understand one another. Seeing you in the audience shows that you have a desire to be a better person. And with that, the DEI Council wants to thank you for being part of the DEI conversation. At this time, I would like to uh, thank our presenting sponsors, Virginia Housing, for supporting our DEI events this year. And I would like to welcome both Frank Webster and Adrian Whitaker, the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Virginia Housing, to share a few words. Good morning, it's the Adrian and Frank show. Or maybe Frank would say the Frank and Adrian show. <laughs> I, have more sense than, I have more sense than that. So thank you so much for having us here this morning. Again, my name is Adrian Whitaker, the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Virginia Housing. At Virginia Housing, we refer to DEI as idea. And I love that word, idea. And for us, that A, stands for access, which ties very closely to who we are and our mission. Now, my friend Frank gave me a wonderful script, and I'm going to now look at it. So, <laughs> but what Frank didn't know is that these over 50 eyes cannot read print this small. But that's okay. That's, oh, no, no, no I, I, got I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. So I, I got the part that's Virginia Housing, he even wrote down for me to know what, I, what IDEA stands for. So I'm going to say that without even looking at the script. So inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And for us at Virginia Housing, creating a workplace that fully reflects the communities we serve, where everyone feels empowered. Conducting outreach efforts to reach diverse individuals with, emphasis, with an emphasis on underserved and marginalized communities, listening and engaging with diverse communities to meet their needs, and valuing teamwork with our diverse suppliers and business partners. And now, my part. <laughs> I'm back. And I'm still waiting for my own office here, as much time as, as Adrian and I are spending here these days. So of course, the culmination of all of these efforts is to provide tangible assistance to first time home buyers to help them to overcome the obstacles which prevent them from being able to start receiving the significant benefits of home ownership. So we work with all local professionals to help deliver down payment assistance, closing cost assistance, lower monthly payments, tax credits, home buyer education, and a caring responsive servicing unit which works hard to keep their home, the homeowners in their homes throughout any difficulties they are experiencing. We do appreciate being here today. You, here today. Please talk to us after the session, or if you'd like to have us come out to your office and do a lunch and learn, we'll provide lunch to your office and we'll bring a whole bunch of learning to you. And now we'll just turn this back over to you guys and uh, we're, we're just gonna be here learning just like everybody else. So thank you again for coming. Again, thank you so much for Adrian and Frank for being here and supporting us. Um, by raising your hands, how many in this room attended the March general membership meeting? That's almost everybody. That's, imp that's impressive. <laughs> that is impressive. Uh, so at that time, if you were there, you did see our instructor, Jason Elliott's engaging uh, LGBTQ plus uh, overview. If you did not get to participate in the March general membership meeting, that you can still go back to our CAR YouTube page and watch that presentation. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have Jason come back today for a much longer session and to continue this valuable conversation today. <laughs> a lifelong Virginian, Jason has called Charlottesville home since 2010. 
He is a graduate of the Tidewater Community College and the University of Virginia. He's a veteran public health professional with the most of his career being dedicated to inclusive sexual health education and HIV prevention. Jason's own journey through coming out, mental health, and personal growth led him to establish the Jason Elliott Show and began traveling as a speaker, workshop, workshop facilitator, and curator of inclusive events. To learn more about Jason, you can refer to the handout that we gave you today. If you have any questions for Jason, please find the microphones located on the corners of the room at the end of his presentation. His presentation will be roughly an hour and we'll have about 20 minutes of question and answers afterwards. So at this time, I will turn it over to Jason. Okay. I got to carry it. Thank you. I don't have a hand up. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. All right. You would think I would know to get set up before I walk up here, but here we are. All right. Super, super excited to be here today. This one's working, right? Great. Okay. Super excited to be back with y'all today. Um, I will first say that I am wearing a different blazer than what was in that picture, even though it looks very similar. Um, but as was pointed out this morning, <clears throat> the boots are the same. So we're just going to uh, add that one. All right. So this morning we are talking about Somewhere Under the Rainbow, an introduction to all things LGBTQ+. My name is Jason Elliott. I prefer he, him pronouns. Uh, so that means I would like you to call me that, but you can call me anything you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. That is not the first or last bad joke I've made today. Um, all right, so we're going to jump right into a little bit of what we're going to be doing today, uh, just to make sure we keep on track. Today, we're going to see some stats. We're going to learn some stuff. We're going to take on some other stuff. Then we're going to apply some of that stuff. And then hopefully ask a ton of questions. Uh, that's the one that I like the most because that's what this is for me. Um, a lot of times we have presenters come out and we have a lot of slides with a whole lot of information on it and it's really helpful, but we don't have the opportunity to have discussions and we don't get to ask the questions that are most important to us. So that's what we're, uh, we're really gonna focus on today. I know Ben said, ask questions at the end. I'm just gonna buck the system on that and say ask questions whenever you feel like it. Uh, and I'll talk to you more about that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, so getting started, just like we did last time, we want to start with creating our very own safe space here today. Uh, as a reminder, learning is where we are, not where we want to be. So it's okay not to know something. Uh, it's okay to be curious. It's okay to maybe even disagree. Uh, but most importantly, it's okay to remember that exactly where you are is where you should be today. Mm, I got to remember, point in the right direction. Some things will never change. Um, a lot of us know some things and some of us know a lot of things, but today all of us have the ability to teach and to learn, which is going to be really important because when we ask those questions, maybe it's a question that we have too. Um, when we share our own experience, maybe some of that will be the same or different that someone else has. Uh, that's why I always say that much of today is going to be subjective and relative uh, because my interpretation of something might be different than your interpretation of something. My experience might be crazy different from what somebody else would tell you theirs was. So it's really important to remember that I'm just one person talking up here today, but we're talking about an entire community of human beings who have an experience. And most importantly, like I said last time, this came out of middle schools and high schools when I was talking to them and the kids would run into the hallway and then make fun of everybody. Uh, so we said, anything goes and everything stays. Anything is welcome here. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to have opinions. Um, anything goes here. Everything also stays. It ties into learning. I want you to take that with you. Uh, but when we leave, it's not, did you know me? She asked that question. Or, oh my gosh, I thought everybody knew that. Because why? Learning is where we are, not where we want to be. So with that, welcome to a diversive, inclusive, accepting, welcoming, safe space for everyone, including you. Uh, and I know that you were welcomed already because I saw the sign on the door today, which was super exciting. I hope that stays forever and ever. And if not, I'll make sure it will. All right. Uh, so like we said, discussion is welcome throughout uh, today. 
I, obviously, you have your microphones, but if you want to speak up, you can do that too. I'll repeat the question um, if anybody has trouble hearing it. Uh, so by all means, please feel free to be part of this conversation. It's more a conversation than a presentation. If you don't feel comfortable asking questions, I'm crossing my fingers that Slido is going to work today. You can scan this QR code that you see up on the screen, or you can head to slido.com and put in those seven digits, and that'll give you an opportunity to type your question, and I'll see it up here when, when I check it, but nobody will know who's asking the question. It'll be there, but your name's not. So if it's something where you're like, ah, maybe not everything is going to stay, let me go ahead and type it. Put it in there. I mean, I am going to read it to everybody. Okie dokie. So why me here today? Last time, um, you all saw a little list of why it's me here today. We're changing it up because I put in pictures today. Uh, as you know, uh, based on that flyer there, I'm a veteran public health professional. For over a decade, I've been working uh, with public health and uh, inclusive sexual health uh, practices. And I also travel as a speaker and MC for Pride events. I did throw in the picture of earlier this month being here because that was really great, and because I was threatened by some of you after last week, if I didn't put a picture of me in drag, you would revolt. So um, there's a picture of me in drag. All uh, right. Boom. So let's, like last time, start with taking a look at some stats. A lot of what we talk about today is going to be familiar if you were here earlier in the month, uh, but because so many of you said, oh my gosh, this is incredible, I wish I could hear this every day, you're going to hear it again today. Um, but it is really important because these stats really speak to the significance of what we're doing here. If you were here in March, hopefully you might recall we asked how many Americans identify as LGBTQ+. Uh, does anybody remember? What do you say? We don't whisper around here. You should know that. Okay, so we got to vote for 7%. Anybody else? All right. Now I know who my Robert's Rule of Orders is around here. Love it. So in 2012, we were at about 3.5%. Uh, that was one of the first times that there was a concerted effort to make sure that we had a grasp on how many people identified within the community here. Um, by 2017, that was up to 4.5%. And one of the last major um, studies showed in 2021 that about 7.1% of uh, Americans identify as LGBTQ+. If you will recall, that's um, a small number for some people when we think about it. I will also point out that was a couple of years ago and maybe the pandemic did a lot for a lot of people, I don't know. Um, but we can see that there has been a steady increase. Uh, everybody always says, why is that the case? Um, part of me wants to say it's the case because we're providing training like this and we're creating spaces like this one. Uh, the other part of me also thinks it's because we have more options. You know, we, we talk about the colors of the rainbow, but we also talk about those tones and those shades within it. So maybe somebody who growing up thought, well, I'm either gay or straight, then was like, oh, I can be bi? What? I can be pansexual? I can be omnisexual? And if those words don't mean anything to you, they will in a minute. Um, so I think now we've realized that there really is this true spectrum, and there's room for everybody under the rainbow. Now, 7.1% may still seem kind of low, but as a reminder, only about 2 to 6% of Americans are redheads. Um, again, I'm not going to point out the fact that there are two here today. Uh, and I think, statistically, that means, hi. <laughs> um, so anyway, just think about that. If you know a redhead, if you've seen a redhead, if you love a redhead, you probably also know, have seen, or love someone who's in this community, which is really important. Today, specifically, it's important to remember that also means you might be working with someone in the community or that you might uh, have already sold a home to someone in the community. So uh, I think it's really important to think about why does that matter. Um, we have talked a lot about the youth, and that's always an important topic for me, so I will always include these, even though they're not buying homes from us yet. Uh, high school students who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual are more than four times as likely to have attempted suicide than heterosex heterosexual peers. Um, and that continues through adulthood because about 40% of transgender adults have attempted suicide in their lifetime compared to less than 5% of the general U.S. population. Those are just two of the stats related to mental health specifically that I think are, are really important. Um, but mental health, 
applies to other areas of our life and it impacts so many other arenas. LGBTQ youth and young adults have 120% higher percent risk of experiencing homelessness. Um, that, is, that one hits home for me because as you heard it earlier, I fell into that stat. Um, I am that 120% who was sleeping in my truck and sleeping in the libraries at, at UVA and running somewhere to take a shower or making really good use of the locker rooms at the gyms there. Uh, you get real creative, but it doesn't take away from the fact that some people don't have those resources. When we say homeless, a lot of the individuals who experience that truly are exactly that. <clears throat> Only about 11% of our community says that they prefer to rent versus to buy. Um, and this highlights the strong desire for those of us in the community to be the opposite of that, that homeless statistic. Uh, and uh, like I said last time, I was part of the 89% who wasn't satisfied with it. So 10 years after I was homeless, I became a home buyer. Uh, and like I pointed out, and we'll continue to point out until November, I'm the president of the HOA and regretting it every day. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I love it, it's really great. Um, but it's really important to remember that this stuff really impacts how we're living our day-to-day -day life. Um, about half of the community says that they fear some sort of retaliation or judgment when going through the home buying process. Uh, so it's really, really important that we remember, even if someone doesn't say it, most likely they're feeling it. Uh, and that might be something like, I don't wanna tell them that I'm bringing a husband with me, or well, I really don't wanna say that when they get my legal documents, it might have a different name on it than what I told them, and I really don't want to explain why. Those things keep us from searching out a new home, from building our lives. So keep that in mind as we go through today and you go through uh, your important work. All right, so last time we learned some of the basic letters, uh, and the most requested thing, aside from the picture of me in drag, uh, was that we go over those letters again and that we go over more of them. Uh, so we've got a couple of slides with a ton of letters on them. So we're gonna start with that, uh, and then we're gonna move into uh, kind of sex versus orientation versus gender versus expression, um, kind of do a little compare and contrast work there. And then if we need a little like five minute breather to process, we can do that. Uh, but we'll wrap up then with taking a few action steps, uh, a couple of resources, and then the Q&A. All right, so. Learning the letters. Uh, a lot of times we see LGBTQ plus and we're like, yep, those are those people. Or yep, that's that rainbow brigade. I, I don't know what it means though. Now we will. We've got LGBTQ plus. Let's start with the L. Does anybody remember what L is? That's right. There we go. <laughs> Just took a little point at the toes. <laughs> All right, so yeah, lesbian. Uh, and as we described last time, this is someone who is female, woman, or woman identifying who has an attraction to the same. What about gay? This one caused a stir last time. I'm not going to lie. Lots of people had lots of thoughts on this. Do you remember how we talked about this? This was kind of one of those terms where it can identify a male, man, or man identifying person who's attracted to the same, but it's also been used as like a collective for this entire community. And last time when we talked about that, um, there were a couple of people who came up and were like, oh my gosh, I've been offending my lesbian friends because I've been calling them gay. I didn't know that I was using the wrong word. Uh, and it's one of those times of, hey, like sometimes we use words specifically, sometimes we use them generally. Um, I would imagine that that person's lesbian friends would probably correct them if they wanted to be called a lesbian instead of gay. Uh, but who knows, maybe not. Um, but I, I think that this one is really kind of interesting because we're going to talk about another word in a few minutes that is kind of now shifting to be that collective term. Uh, T, I'm sorry, D. <laughs> so there's this thing about people skipping over bisexual people, and I just did it. No. Um, so, gosh. Learning is where we are, not where we want to be. All right. Uh, so bisexual is a term that's used uh, typically to identify someone who uh, is attracted to man, men, or men identifying people, and women, women, or women or female identifying people. 
Uh, and so uh, bisexual, uh, a lot of times people will joke that it's like a gateway or it's kind of like the way that you can step your way there. It is a very valid piece of our, of our uh, community, even if I would say it's like the alphabet. Um, but I, I think that's a, a really important one to remember. Uh, and one that's also important, especially right now, which we've seen a lot of legislation about, is transgender. Uh, the easiest way to talk about um, what transgenderism is or what a, a transgender person may be is someone who was born, said that they were one way, and grew up and said, actually, no. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about um, sex versus gender uh, in a few minutes. Um, but the easiest way to remember that is someone who was told you're born this and you grow up and say, I'm actually not. Uh, and we will talk a little more in depth shortly about it. Queer, uh, and I also put slash questioning because depending on who you ask, that LGBTQ uh, is either queer or questioning. Uh, the queer term is one that a lot of people still shudder at because for many, 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 many years, uh, this term was used as the derogatory term uh, for people of the LGBTQ plus community. In recent days, um, in the last few years, there's been kind of this reclamation of the term to be uh, like the umbrella term. So it's really interesting because you'll see a lot of people like, you know, young kids up to, I would say, early 30s or so feel okay using this word. Then when you hit that like, 40 to 70 mark, it's like, mm -mm, I remember how we use that word. And so that's where you see some, some people saying, I don't wanna use that term. And then once you get to about 80 plus, I think that is the term that I hear most people in the 80 plus category use, because they're like, that's it. Like, this, this is my chance to do something before I'm out of here. We're reclaiming this word. Uh, and so, you know, what, whatever the motive is. So you may hear that term being used, um, and, and again, there are some people, my mom, for example, can't stand this word. So when I talk about hosting queer socials with her, I'm like, the LGBTQ plus socials that I do, because for her, it's still an offensive word. Um, even though she doesn't identify in the community, it, it does something to her that she then feels her sons are in danger because people are using this word. So just important to have that communication. Now, there are more. We talked about the plus last time. And it just wasn't good enough for you all. So we're gonna go through some more letters. Uh, these are letters and terms that you hear that have to deal with um, expression, with orientation, with attraction. Uh, and they may be some that you've heard, maybe some that you haven't heard. And if there's any on this list that you wanna delve into, again, you can ask questions or you can type them into the phone. Uh, and if I am not looking, just like give me like a, and I'll check the phone too. Nobody will see you wink, it's fine. All right, so some of the letters that were specifically asked by you all earlier this month um, that we'll go over that are incorporated in the plus. Asexual and aromantic. Now here's a, a little pro tip for you. When you see a word that has a in front of it, think of it as like, nah, it's not there. Or no, nope, doesn't exist. So when we talk about people who identify as asexual or aromantic, we're talking about not feeling a sexual attraction or a romantic attraction. A sexual, a romantic. They don't identify with any particular attraction, with any particular um, uh, romantic endeavors. And you may also hear this with a gender, um, is someone who doesn't identify with a particular gender. There we go. Forgot that was on the floor. Um, so remember, a blank, most likely, most of the time, not whatever the blank is. All right, if we're talking about demisexual, uh, this is somebody who uh, requires an emotional bond to form a sexual attraction. So a lot of times, uh, you know, we just think, oh yeah, that person is attracted to this person. There, there are people who identify as demisexual, meaning like, if you are dumb, I am not going to be attracted to you. Don't think about your partners. <laughs> you might go home with a different perspective today. Um, and similar to that is a sapiosexual as someone who's attracted to intelligence regardless of a person's identity. So these are very similar and they can be very confusing. Um, so I think about this as like sapiosexual is I'm attracted to your intelligence. Demisexual is your uh, intelligence gives me a gateway to be attracted to you. If that makes sense. Yeah. All right, cool. A little confusing. I know. 
All right. Gender fluid is describing uh, one's gender or identity, identity as self-expression and not static. Uh, and so uh, this is basically, if somebody says, uh, you may hear them say, well, some days, you know, I lean more into the man side of myself and other days, not so much. Um, someone who identifies as gender fluid has that ability and desire and enjoyment of being just whatever they are when they wake up during the day, which I personally think is a very beautiful thing. Uh, Non-binary or gender queer means that they don't conform to the binary gender identities. A binary gender identity meaning man or woman. Uh, so somebody who's non-binary or gender queer may feel like there's something in between or something outside of what we classify as man, woman, or masculine, feminine. Uh, and I mentioned pansexual and omnisexual earlier. Uh, this is someone with a desire for all genders and sexes. They're very similar, but again, just like we talked about a minute ago, they have some, some nuances with them. So think about pansexual being gender blind. I don't, I don't see your gender. I'm just attracted to you. Uh, omnisexual, I'm aware of your gender and I'm still attracted to you. I'm not attracted to you. I'm just looking at you while I say that. Uh, oh, do you have HR here? Uh, so, oh, I know how to pick them. Um, all right, so think about that as like having just attraction where you're like, man, this other stuff doesn't matter. Or attraction where you're like, all right, I acknowledge this stuff is here and I'm, I'm still moving with that attraction. Uh, and then the last one uh, on our list for today is two-spirit. You might see that as the 2S um, when we do LGBTQIA, uh, like 2S um, plus, depending on how you write it out. This is two-spirit. Um, it's a third gender that's recognized by most of our indigenous American cultures uh, and it actually throughout the world. And they have different terminology throughout the world. The hedra um, in South Asia, for example, uh, is comparative to two-spirit here. Great. You know it all? <laughs> I only believe the one person who said, nope, I don't. Any other questions about what the plus is or any of the letters or any of these that you see or anything that you don't see? Anybody winking at me to look at my phone? Okay. Well, this is all the live eye today. Um, the one thing to remember, like I said last time, is these are just letters. They're not the human beings that adopt them, that identify with them, or that hold them to them, themselves. All of our lives are full of nuances and the details that make us unique. Uh, and like we talked about earlier, it's not just red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, but it's also that turquoise or that teal or maybe that violet or the magenta. It's all those shades that we see that make things so beautiful. So whether you're under the rainbow or not, you've got your own nuances and details about your life that make you unique. Uh, and rather than attributing a letter to somebody, we can flip that around and just attribute a person to a letter if we want to, or even better, a person as a person. All righty. Now let's move on to the meat of the subject here. Uh, this is delicious. D is our genderbred person. I cannot take credit for this wonderful drawing. I can take credit for the name though. That's the drag queen coming out of me. So the next few slides basically are gonna teach us the difference between sex, identity, gender, and expression. Uh, and to help with that, we have D. Uh, and D is uh, basically gonna let us use this diagram to learn about those topics. And we're gonna start with biological sex. So biological sex is the anatomical, physiological, genetic or physical attributes that indicate a person is male, female, or intersex. This has a lot to do with things like how much of what hormones are in your body, um, what body parts are identifiable when you're born, and what your chromosomes might say chemically is happening in your body. Uh, now there's one term in there that you may or may not be as familiar with. It's intersex. Uh, intersex is a condition that basically when you're born, you may have some or none of the characteristics of what we would typically see of male and female. So this may be somebody who has the chromosomes for both sexes, 
or it may be somebody who has a mixture that's a little bit unique to them. Uh, and it's really important that we highlight this because it, it shows, in my personal opinion, uh, that sometimes nature says, nah, not quite male, not quite female, you can be exactly who you are. Uh, and so if nature can do that, if our chromosomes can do that, uh, and our body parts can naturally form that way, I think that it's really great that we're here today to remember that we can also do that. Um, so that's, uh, that's how we're gonna categorize biological sex. That's when a, you're born and a doctor looks at you and says, from the outside, I think you're this. But sometimes that doesn't stick because we've got gender identity. A lot of times, gender identity, uh, which is a person's sense of self as a man, a woman, gender fluid or gender variant, um, that starts to come into play between the ages of 18 months and three years. That's when we start to realize, oh, I'm, I'm a person. If you've ever seen a baby around that time, that's when they realize they have hands and those hands can grab things like our hair or our necklaces, or maybe even at some point grabbing things that they shouldn't be grabbing and pulling things off countertops. Um, that's also when they look in the mirror and realize, oh, that's not another baby looking at me, that's me. So that's when that self-awareness really starts to set in. That's also at the same time that we start to realize that we have this gender identity. Now, a lot of that um, is an outside force, which we'll talk about in just a minute, but this is the time when we start to identify who we are and we start to understand where we're leaning in this gender spectrum. Do we have questions on gender? Great. This is less about body parts and more about like heart parts and mind parts and spirit parts. But sometimes, there we go. Sometimes what we are expected to project does not match up between what that doctor said, this is what you are, and what we during our self journey realize who we are. So that's where gender expression comes into play. Gender expression uh, is a term that we use for the ways in which a person communi communicates their gender within a given culture, within a given setting, or within a society. Um, so a good way to think about this is when somebody's having a baby girl, all the balloons are pink. And when somebody's got a boy who's turning four or five, all the toys are like G.I. Joe. And they're like fire trucks and police cars and stuff like that, like our masculine, more manly toys. Uh, as we grow up, that might be things like, um, well, that man over there's got painted fingernails. I don't think that's right. Or it may be, that woman has a really short haircut. That doesn't seem to fit. Uh, but it's really important to remember that how we express gender changes from setting to setting to setting. So for example, if I were to wear a kilt in here, which I wear quite regularly, people would be like, I love your skirt, that's so great. And people constantly say, I love that you're breaking down gender stereotypes by wearing a skirt. If I were to take a trip over to Scotland and wear my kilt, no one would bat an eye. And they wouldn't think I was trying to make a political statement because in that environment, in that setting, that's just what you do. So it's really important to remember that gender expression really is a social construct. It really is something that the outside tells us we have to do. Uh, so if men are wearing pink or purple, or if women are deciding one day, I'm gonna wear pants instead of a skirt. That's based on where we're at at that point in time. But more importantly, that's our expression. Questions on that? I got so excited, I thought you were raising your hand for a question. Uh, that's okay. You know why? Because we're flying through, which means we're gonna have a whole lot of questions at the end of this. All right, um, attraction and orientation. This is where all those other terms that we talked about really come into play and where a lot of times it gets kind of scary and where a lot of times we forget like, oh my gosh, I don't have to categorize every single person, but this does not make sense to me. The attraction and the orientation is the inner feelings of who a person is attracted to emotionally or physically in relation to how they view themselves. And that last part is the key. 
because we can't look at someone and say, ah, that person is clearly a lesbian. Because we don't know, does that person identify as a lesbian? Or are we misgendering that person? Are we misinterpreting those social cues based on how they look or how they move or things like that? So in relation to their own identity, um, I identify as a, a man, a male, and for the most part, I find myself attracted to the same. So for me, it's all about my identity, and then we get to attribute a label to that of gay or bisexual or pansexual or lesbian or any of those terms we've talked about. Um, but this is where it gets really hard because when we look at people, their attractions are different than ours. Uh, and a lot of times we say like, what's your type? Well, sometimes that type is gonna be a little different depending on who you're talking to. Um, I don't think all of us in here have the same type. Actually, I would guarantee you, we don't all have the same type. Um, but it's really important to remember that attraction and orientation starts with that person and moves out. Whereas things like your assigned sex at birth is outward. Okay, questions on that? Y'all are gonna have to come up with a lot of questions because I said we'd be here till 11.30. Yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> what you got? What you got? Congratulations. Well, and I've come down the road of the road that I've been on, the journey I've been on. So I would say, and I'm, you may be getting to this anyway, but you know, there's a whole lot more involved in um, attraction and the type of person that you're attracted to. Uh, I mean, I believe in my heart of hearts that souls are gender fluid. I just believe it. So I'm attracted to the soul, whoever that soul might be. Although I am a lesbian and I'm a gay for 26 years. So, um, but it's more, it's not, it's not, it's just not super complicated. It's just uh, fluid. And uh, it really just comes down to accepting for who's in front of you. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, I, I mean, I make a point, I don't make a point of it, but I always say, if I'm talking about my wife, I say my wife, except that somebody leaves for some other, it's not that I, it's not a calculated uh, choice of words, it's just my wife. <laughs> so I just don't think it's any big deal. It's just, it's not, it's not like, it's fluid. I think it's moving in a different direction of what's in, whoever's in front of you. Yep, I, I love it. I think it's great. and. And that really speaks to what we've talked about earlier is a lot of times it's our, our settings. A lot of times it's our upbringing um, that kind of determine how, how likely we are to be able to lean into that fluidity or how likely it is that we're gonna understand when someone else is or isn't doing it too. Um, and you're right, we can have all the slides in the world with all the pictures, with all the words. We could have 100 people come up here and talk and you're gonna hear a hundred different things than what's on this slide um, or what's on any slide that you give. And I think that's really important to highlight, again, the idea that we're all unique and we have that perspective. Um, but I happen to agree with you. It's a lot, a lot more complicated, um, which is why typically this stuff takes a lifetime to learn instead of just a little bit. Anything else on this? Sure. Um, so I am a mom of a five-year-old, and so not so long ago, I uh, was going through the baby shower process and even just toys for kids that are so gender-specific. Um, and so that's kind of at this young age, but then looking into schools, you know, there's huge, you know, societal pressure, and we're getting this from the government, um, with pushback against gender-neutral bathrooms and students being able to participate on athletic teams of their identified gender, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, as opposed to perhaps the gender or the sex that they were born as. Um, and so what can we do? I mean, this just feels like such, the headwinds are against us. Um, and so what can we do, suggestions that you have to try to buck some of these norms? Um, I, think, I think there's a, I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Did you need me to read? Uh, yes. Education is a big part of it. 
Um, and we will, after, we're gonna take a, just a little break because I know the chairs are uncomfortable. Uh, we'll take just a little like breather, fill up on your coffee kind of a thing. And when we come back, we'll talk about some things that we can do across the board um, to, to kind of support the community. Um, but in this instance in particular, one of my favorite things that I do is when one of my friends is having a baby, which seems to be all of them right now, uh, is like, I go, I have a, a, a friend of mine who writes a children's book, uh, and he specifically incorporates LGBTQ plus characters. Uh, and there's like one book where the princess or the prince grows up to become the king or the queen. Uh, and, and it's kind of this role reversal type situation where um, I think reading that as a bedtime story could be something really cool. That if that child is already feeling that way, it's validation. If that child is not feeling that way, it's education. And I think it's really important to do things like that. Um, to me, I also feel like I'm making a little bit of a statement to the other adults in the room when I give like books. Like We would rather have smart kids than kids that have all the toys. Uh, but also, let me tell you about this book. Let me support this LGBTQ writer. Um, so that, that's like just a small little thing specific to a baby shower that, that I do. Um, but I also think you know, that, that's important as we look to children growing up is thinking about the same thing. Um, you know, like what costumes are we giving them the chance to wear at Halloween? What they want or what we think everybody in the neighborhood thinks they should have on. Um, so if we can find gendered um, like norms and then just find a little way to tweak it a little bit, um, this, this stuff isn't gonna change quickly. Uh, somebody from a state agency this morning was talking about shifting the culture of the agency, and they said it's like this massive battleship. We can turn the wheel now, but it's gonna be 20 minutes before everybody feels that the ship has turned. And that's kind of where we are. I think that we're maybe more like into the 10 or 15 minutes of that 20 minutes, because we look at history and we see that a lot of people have done a lot um, to get us to the point where I can stand here and openly identify who I am, and then share my story with people. Um, but we still got a long way to go before we feel the turn of our, of our ship. Um, I'll keep thinking too on like specifics. I'm not a dad yet, so I can't show you what I've done with my kids. Um, bless their souls for when I do though. Um, but yeah, we'll keep thinking on it. And then when we talk about ways that we as a group can lead from here uh, and actually take action steps, maybe some other folks can share their ideas too. Great. So let's take a little breather, um, get some coffee, if there's coffee, and if there's not, blame somebody else. Um, and we will be back in, let's see, five minutes. Yes, that's great, we'll do that. If you don't need coffee, at least stand up and stretch. I don't want anybody getting blood clots. I forgot to give you a two minute warning, I'm so sorry. This is your 15 second warning. Okie dokie, artichokies. Whew. Here we go. Listen, if I can go teach at middle schools, I can deal with a bunch of realtors. It's all right. <laughs> all right. So I hope you enjoyed your little quick breather, came up with some questions. Um, if somebody can put, like, somebody, can you pull up Slido and do like a test question, or can somebody? Because maybe y'all are just being bashful today, but there are no questions in Slido. I thought for sure somebody would feel so uncomfortable in this group that they would have to use an anonymous question service, but maybe not. Um, don't Here, don't worry about it. It's fine. No, nobody has sent one. Can somebody send me a test question, please? So, no, no one has sent a question. I need some, no one. Read between the lines. All right, yeah. We'll do, we'll do a question, then we'll talk about some of the ways we can apply. Yeah. Okay. I personally do. Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, I, I have no hesitation whatsoever. I think that number is exponentially higher. Uh, and I think, again, part of that is a lot of people may not know that they are part of the community, 
because we just don't have education, we don't have inclusion. The other part is a lot of people maybe don't want other people to know that they're part of the community. So stigma and stereotypes are really, really powerful uh, and they keep us hidden for quite some time. So simple answer, yeah. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I think it is really important to remember that you know a stat is just a stat, um, but the reality of the situation is that's just a number. It doesn't represent you know, our community. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat the question too. That's my fault. It's terrible. So I think a lot of times people get so hung up on the sexual end of it mm -hmm. that they don't realize that that's not everything that comes about. And so they're so hung up on that that they can't get past it and see the actual person, who they are, what their identity is. And so, and I think a lot of, you know, I'm sorry, but a lot of times it's the this men. Is a safe space. <laughs> a lot of times it's the men. The men. Because they, you know, they get hung up on the sexual part of it. Mm. And it's, it's who the person is. It's not all sex. I agree with that last part for sure. Um, I, I do think that there's a lot of value in remembering that like what we're doing and who we're doing it with and how we're doing it doesn't necessarily impact who we are like when we're selling a home. I'm pretty sure that breaks some rules if it does. Um, but I, I think it is really important to remember that like, like we said last time, a diamond shines brightest when it has many different facets. Um, but we're not always just saying, well, this one piece of that diamond, like, I don't like the way that's cut. We look at the rock. We look at it when it's on our hand. We look at it when it's being its full self. And so when it comes to people, I always try to remind us, all of us, you know, it's really important that we, we may like to do other things with people that's different than what you like to do, but unless I'm asking you to do it with me, it really doesn't matter. Like, you're not part of that. Um, what matters, do what? Well, that's how I, I mean, I, I feel that way. But again, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, we, when we are, sorry, that threw me off when you said that. I was about to go a very different direction. Um, but no, I, I think you're, you're right. We as people, very different than we as sexually active human beings. Yes, ma'am. I'm mic man. <laughs> um, I have a 18 year old transsexual or transgender child who is getting ready to leave home and move to Richmond. I am worried for his safety. Can you speak to how, do you feel safe? Do you kind of shelter yourself with like-minded people? And what should I tell him to avoid or be careful of? Yeah, uh, my first thing I wanna say is thank you for being a parent that cares. Um, that is, I think, one of the number one things that any of us in the community um, need is support and especially when it's early support and when it's close support. Um, so that's the first thing I wanna say. I will answer your question of, um, yes, I, I feel safe. Um, I also do though feel aware. So I know when I'm going out in Richmond or when I had a stint working in Richmond, I knew certain places there were gonna be people like me. I also knew there were other places where if I went there, yeah, maybe I should keep in mind how much like I talk about this stuff, you know, or how much I, I act it out. Um, I will say that in my experience, Richmond has been very welcoming for the most part, just like Charlottesville. We are a, a pretty safe place. There's always gonna be a bad apple in every bunch. There's always gonna be a place where it's like, eh, maybe I shouldn't be making out with someone on that street corner. Um, but you know, that's a different conversation. Um, but I, I definitely think um, if it makes you feel any better that the resources available to the LGBTQ plus community um, are uh, immense in Richmond. Uh, and so your child will have the opportunity to go to bars or clubs that 
cater and are safe for our community. Um, they're gonna have the opportunity to meet people at the university or at a workplace um, who know, hey, this group is getting together. Um, this weekend, for example, there are a couple of events happening in Richmond for um, like trans day of awareness uh, and for trans resilience. Uh, and so having the opportunity to make connections is another resource really important to our community that I think um, they're gonna really hopefully enjoy down in Richmond. And if not, Charlottesville is just an hour and 20 minutes up the street. Um, I actually drove down here from Richmond, so I do want to give you one really good resource for your child. And it is, um, it's called Diversity Richmond. Um, wonderful resource, great events, lots of networking, um, brings all people together, very safe space. So I was gonna raise my hand before you said that, but I wanted to share that as the person from Richmond in the room. Um, but I, I also wanted to ask about, you mentioned resources and one of the statistics that really hit home for me was when you were talking about the, um, the suicide rate um, amongst the entire community but what really hit home for me was with the, with the youth. And um, I've worked with LGBTQ youth, but I'm also remembering a time when I was a teenager and I'm in my 50s, so that was a long time ago. But when I was a teenager and one of my friends who was a lesbian got into a fight with me out of nowhere, just got angry with me in school, got into a fight, and I remember going home and telling my mom about it. And I was so angry with her. And my mom wanted me to invite her over. And she explained to me that her day at school was very different than my day at school. And it was very important for me to always keep that in mind that I don't know what she faced before she got to see me at lunchtime. My question is, Knowing that we have kids in schools who are facing so much, what resources can parents have so that their child is not a statistic? Yep. Um, I think that one resource that's really important is an organization called Be Flag. Um, that's the Parents of Lesbians and Gays um, uh, Alliance. Gosh, all the letters. See, sometimes even I forget them. Um, but they have resources specifically for parents, for other family members, and for friends of uh, specifically youth who are dealing with coming out, um, finding their identity, and living authentically. Um, there, there's also Key Flag of the Blue Ridge, a little closer to home, uh, and that's that's one of the groups that's kind of like an offshoot of this national organization. Um, so I, that would be my very first direction to point any family member or parent to. Um, you can have online meetings, you can meet in person, and sometimes, um, you know, I, I talk about my coming out, I was very lucky that my mom said, you know what, that's not how I was raised, I don't agree with it, but please help me learn. I was very lucky, and every Saturday, I would sit down with my mom, and we would have a back and forth of, all right, I just don't understand, blah, 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 or, okay, but I thought, blank, blank, blank. And having that space was really important. But the one thing she says she wished she had was another mom to talk to. Uh, and so Key Flag gives you that. So it's really, really great. Absolutely. OK, I'm going to stand because I feel like at this point, if you haven't noticed, I've been crying this entire meeting because it started with that slide that you asked about with the statistics. and. I am the mom of, well, two children I have birthed and live, well, not exactly with me. It's complicated. We should have coffee sometime. Um, but what I will say is in 2018, I was running my sales business. And for a couple of days, I was doing so from the emergency room at UVA. Because my child, who I love incredibly more than anything in this world, is a child who attempted suicide and is also transgender. So we started with this slide and I couldn't freaking stop crying from there. <laughs> I stop, I get it together, and then I cry some more. Um, and I, I can't tell you, first of all, I am 
in awe that I'm standing here in this room with you guys as a group of realtors who is an industry that is known for being a dinosaur and being behind the times. And I am so grateful that you're here and that this conversation is happening. And that while we are not all starting from the same place, that we are all here to have this conversation. So as a mother of a child that I'm just really grateful is still alive, thank you. Um, and the reality is, is the fact that you have shown up today means that you are willing to have those conversations. And I will say, so part of my, my normal job is like meeting some of you guys and having conversations and just knowing that we're friendly faces who work on other sides of the deal with each other. And I have had multiple times where that coffee ended up in a conversation where we had an opportunity to discuss things like, hey, can I ask you real quick? Like, I don't understand they, them. And you know what we did? Instead of talking about real estate, we talked about pronouns. And that's okay. But the fact that I am in this community with a group of people who are willing to ask those questions and the fact that I feel like I have become a safe person for a lot of other adults to ask, because I don't mind asking the dumb questions all day. First of all, I have children. I'm used to that. <laughs> also, I'm a person who's not terribly fearful of asking the dumb question. But I just, I can't share how grateful I am to just be standing here and for all of you in this room. So thank you. Thank you. And truly, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I think that is, if nothing else, a reminder that we may not ever know how close in a room we are to the reality of what we're learning today. It's also a good reminder that I forgot again to wear waterproof mascara today. <laughs> we had this talk two weeks ago. We could have remembered. Um, <laughs> get out of here, man. Um, that's fine. You saw his shoes today. He was waiting for a reason to walk around everybody. Um, I mean, nothing. Um, oh no, I'm I'm done now. For the next five minutes. May I? May All I, right. I, so making. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll do sorry, this, and I, then we'll talk about making that difference. I just wanted to share something else. Please. from a lesbian perspective or a person's perspective that um, I'm pretty mainstream. I mean, you can tell most people know me. I'm pretty mainstream. And I use that to my advantage because I can, I'm like a bridge. I always like to myself as a bridge. I can move through populations of people and just be who I am and not um, have no expectations of how I'm going to be received. Now, I have to keep reminding myself of that. But I, I, I and, and for me, I mean, it started from, you know, it's, it's, I don't, everybody has their own journey. Everybody does. Being a lesbian, being gay, being transgender, everybody has their, their journey and it's individual to them. And I don't, I don't judge or question anybody's choice of when they step up and share who they really are. So I, it's, everybody has their own timing. So I just want to say that because of how I've chosen to do my life in this way of being uh, a bridge, it makes it easier for people that are in my presence just to kind of like, oh, okay, you know? And so hopefully more people will be like that. So children that are gay, lesbian, whatever, can say, ah, it's okay. And you know, how, what, however way it works for them, in their journey to come out and say, this is who I am. I mean, it's very courageous. I mean, I, I had a, my uncle, Miguel, my father's brother was, was a, which I never knew till much later, was a cross dresser. I never knew that. And I learned that many years later. And I was like, yeah, this is great, you know? Now he led a very closeted life. However, he lived the life the way he wanted to in the safe environment that he was in. And I applaud him for that. But there are a lot of people that have given up so much courageous people to make it easier for the next generation. And I will say that in this moment, that's exactly what all of you are here to do. You are serving as that bridge between where we are and where we want to be through learning. Uh, and I think it's also really important to remember that bridges come in all shapes and sizes. Um, we have high rise bridges, we have draw bridges, you probably, as a kid, threw like some dead tree across a ditch in the middle of the woods. That's a bridge, too. So sometimes it's very obvious that we're a bridge, and other times 
it's just there for that one person that needs to get across. So thank you for being a bridge. Um, <laughs> I said, look, I had a perfect segue into being a bridge, how to make a Go difference. <laughs> I was proud of that one. I was like, oh man, I feel it. This is like a Hallmark card on stage. This is great. No, go for it. No, I, clearly we're not ready with each other. <laughs> what you got? So I do want you to address the misconception that a lot of people have that this is a choice, not okay. who you are born and who you are. So that's a question to ask at the beginning of an hour and a half presentation. Um, that is, I don't think that's just anything we can settle in a class. No workshop, no seminar is going to teach that. I can tell you that's what I believe. I can tell you that's what I've experienced. And I would simply ask that you take me at my word for that. I, I can't convince anybody to believe differently. I'm not here to do that either. But I am here to tell you, and we were talking uh, in the break, some other people had this experience too, of having that moment where they are aware and trying to figure out like, what is this awareness? What does this process of becoming aware look like? And what we talked about during the break was that we've all had this moment of awareness of who we are or how we fit in, but it's more about finding the vocabulary and the education behind it to apply that. Um, and so for me, I'm not gonna try to convince everybody that it is, but I will say it's been my experience and I would love, I'm on, I'm for all coffee too. If y'all wanna have coffee with me, come on, let's do it. Um, or bourbon, that might be better for some of us. Uh, <laughs> Um, but for me, for me, that has been my experience is that I, I have never questioned who I was, but I've questioned why I was. And that's where the pain is at. That's where the, I don't feel like I belong comes from. That's where those statistics that we talked about arise. Um, if we can, can let people be and learn to trust that you know you better than I know you, I think we'll get to a point where we don't have to say, can you address this elephant in the room? Because it won't be an elephant anymore. Maybe like a poodle or maybe like a like mouse, but not an elephant. You like the little politic and get around that question? Yeah, I like that. All right, let's talk about making a difference real quick. And I know that uh, y'all are gonna keep coming up with questions. So we got a couple of, couple of minutes for questions at the end still, of course. Uh, making a difference, being that bridge, taking what we've learned and applying it. Some of these will look familiar from the beginning uh, of, of our talk a couple of weeks ago, but there are a couple more in there. Stickers, posters, flags. I say every time that my eyes and people in my community, our eyes are trained and bred to look for the rainbow sticker. We look for the trans pride flag. We look for the arrow ace flag. We look for any symbol that says you're recognized here. Um, I showed you last time, this is the badge that I used uh, as an HIV tester and sexual health educator. And a lot of times I would wear it up here and then I'd be like, this person is skirting around an issue talking about who they're doing what with that's really impacting their health. Or this person is being a little sketch on things. Let me just try something. Boop. That's literally a quarter of an inch by an inch on the back. And the number of times this opened up a conversation to where that person said, oh, I just noticed your rainbow sticker. Can I actually just be honest with you? <laughs> yes, please. As a medical provider, that's really, really important because what we're doing really as, as an identity does impact our health. Um, uh, when you're working with potential buyers, that may be the thing that bridges from being that stat of, I'll be satisfied with being a renter to now I'm one of those, you know, 40 some percent who feel comfortable with who I'm working with because they know I'm moving in my husband. Uh, and so it's really, really important that we give that symbol. Wearing a rainbow sticker doesn't mean you're gonna have every answer. Wearing any sort of thing that says I, I am aware does not say I'm an expert. It just says I'm aware. And for some of us, that's all that matters. So throw up a sticker, throw up on the front door, something that says you're safe here, uh, wear a lapel pin, 
I know Ben's got one on right now. I'm sure he would happily give you an, a link to wherever to get that. Uh, but wearing something that people's eyes can go to could mean the difference between buying a home or not, or more importantly, staying alive another day. So don't be afraid to throw that sticker on there. Um, all right, your email signatures and business cards. This is my number one recommendation for everybody to do today is that when you get back to your email signature, add to the bottom of it, Jason Elliott, in parentheses, he, him. Well, I mean, don't put that because that's not who you are. But you know, what, whatever your, your pronouns of choice may be, um, that says something. Every person that gets your email will then say, huh, this person may not know everything, but they're telling me their pronouns. I can tell them mine. Uh, and that can open up that door. It may also have some people say, you know what, this is not the type of person I want to associate myself with because I'm not ready yet to be a bridge. That's okay, but you've planted a seed. And that's all that matters. So I would say on your business cards and email signatures, throw in your pronouns. If you need help picking them out, I can give you some options. Um, any intake forms that you might have? Uh, and again, some of these apply across the board. Some of these you know, can be used in schools. Uh, some of these can be used in our offices. And other times we can just change our own language. Using gender neutral language, asking preferred names or asking pronouns. Um, as a healthcare provider, it was really important for me to establish from the beginning, when someone walked into my office before they even saw me, they saw a form that said, do you have a partner with you today? Instead of, oh, is your husband going to be joining us? Or, oh, is your wife gonna be here for the showing? We can just say, do you have a partner or any significant others or whatever it might be. Gender neutral. Husband, wife, they're gendered. Spouse, that's not. Mom, dad, mother, father, versus parent, legal guardian. Uh, those, those type of things make a difference. Um, and if you have an intake form for new potential clients, asking them what their preferred name, that might be important for somebody whose ID is going to be something different. The tax documents may not say the same thing that their, you know, that their thank you card says. So really important to remember those types of things. Obviously, safe space training. Uh, we're here today. We're talking about a lot of things. We're sharing a lot. We're being bridges with each other. That's really, really important. Today is not the only day you should do that. Today is not the only day that you can do that. Uh, so finding additional safe space trainings or coming back on November 9th from 10 to 1130 um, to do this again with moi would be great. Um, um, <clears throat> look, I got to pitch that. I got to pitch it hard. I want y'all to come back with waterproof mascara. Um, so safe space training, it can be here. It can be just saying like, hey, Jason, you know what? Can we get that coffee? That's training too. Uh, and more than training, that's exposure, that's experience, and that's sharing with each other and, and being a stronger community because of it. Uh, right, support for the LGBTQ plus community. This one was talked about last time, uh, and some people wanted me to highlight that again today. Um, I would say donate, attend, defend. Uh, I want you to find an LGBTQ plus charity that's doing work that you believe in. Uh, one of my favorites somewhat locally is the LGBTQ Center uh, in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, and they are doing everything from hormone therapy and housing to support groups and drag shows and book reads and all kinds of stuff. Um, I love them. Uh, and there are also um, other like state organizations and national and international organizations too. Um, so find one that feels good to you. If you're more political leaning, find one that's more political leaning. If you love dogs and cats, there are organizations that help um, aging LGBTQ plus people find companion pets. Find it, donate, have a good time with it. Attend, come to our events. When we're having a show, when we're having a book signing, when we are having a drag show, you know, whatever it might be, support us, be there. You're, you're allowed to come to pride events. You're allowed to come to things and support our community. Remember, if you're not part of the community, that it is an event that is like for that community. But I have always said that there would not be LGBTQ people without LGBTQ allies. So as an ally, please attend our stuff. And most importantly, especially right now, defend us. We need defending more now than ever. So when it comes time for you to stand up and say, I don't agree with that legislation, or when 
you see a child who can't go to the bathroom in school, let them know, hey, I'm working to fix that for you. We need to know that we're defended because we're outnumbered. So defend us. Defend us with your vote. Defend us with your voice. Defend us with your time. Defend us. Waterproof mascara, people. Um, and then one of the ones that I encourage for anybody who has an office space is converting any gendered bathrooms to single-use gender-neutral bathrooms. Um, when I was working with some of our um, inclusion at the Department of Health, we took um, all of our facilities that we had the ability to pay for, and we took away the men's bathroom and the women's bathroom. And instead, now we've got one giant bathroom over here and one giant bathroom over here. And we put a urinal in both, we put a regular toilet in both, and we put a baby station in both. Um, and it's just really important that when somebody goes to the bathroom, they can just go to the bathroom. So if you have the ability to, even if it's just changing the sign outside the bathroom that says, go here, there you go. It's super, super easy. You don't have to do a whole remodel. Just rip down that sign and put one up that makes people feel welcome. I know you have, please. Mike Manager. Okay, I just want to add because I'm really, I love it so much, um, especially being a mom of it, transgender children, basically. Have a menstruation station. Love it. Okay, right? It's, it's, it's not, it's so simple. It's so simple. And it means a whole lot to people, right? Not a, not a feminine, whatever, a menstruation station. Also, people are going to love you more, and we are, everybody already pays the pink tax way too much. So, yeah. Thank you for that. I love it. Jason, yes. I've, I've been Googling um, and Amazoning all things that we could have for the car office. So the, <laughs> the bathroom sign instead of male, female just says all gender restroom. Absolutely. Even though, it, well, I mean, I guess it, there's a figure that looks... So, and that, that was actually going to be the thing I was going to ask you is if it had iconography on it. Um, again, we have to be careful because sometimes people are going to be like, well, I don't wear half a dress and that doesn't identify with me anyway. Um, so I, I typically encourage people just to find one that says all gender restroom or simply restroom. Yep. Absolutely. All right, so a couple of resources because we got about five minutes or so um, for QA and stuff like that when we're done. Um, these are a few resources that relate to the things we've talked about specifically today. Um, you know P flag of the Blue Ridge. Um, Centerlink is a great uh, way to find LGBTQ community centers where you're at. Um, so for your child, for example, who is moving to somewhere else, they can go there, put in a zip code, and it'll show any of the registered community centers that are there. Yes, I love it. Um, I am hosting a queer event here that night, so I won't be there, but I want to touch base with you and find out how it goes. Yay, I'm so excited. Um, woo. All right, I can't wait to call and tell them. Um, so uh, that's a great way to find some resources. Human Rights Campaign does a lot of the legislation and lobbying that we need. Seville Pride is a local organization, as is the Shenandoah LGBTQ Center and the LGBTQ Center at UVA. Uh, so those are some great resources. It's important to remember, too, you can contact these places and say, I need a resource for blank. Um, so they are great hubs. Um, the Trevor Project is really important for what we talked about for mental health. I also will plug 988, which is a, the suicide helpline um, that you can dial or text. Um, and that's a, a new number um, in the very recent past, similar to 911, but for mental health crises. Um, so please use that if you need to. Queer Kids Stuff is a great place for parents and for kids and school-themed education and resources. And Virginia Pride is another organization here, uh, obviously in Virginia, based out of Richmond. They do great work. Uh, that little tiny QR code is the out and about. And I host two or three queer socials every month. Uh, we're gonna go bowling on Friday night, which is why I can't be in Richmond with you. Uh, but anybody who's wanting to get out and about is more than welcome. And of course, our wonderful Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, who made all of this possible. I'm sure any one of those individuals or all six of them that you see pictured up there would be happy to have you. Okay, with that. 
even though you've already shared a whole lot, technically, I still have six minutes, right? Great. Yes. Love it. No hesitation. <laughs> Hard to get me out of a room without saying something, Jason, but I just want to. <laughs> I'll piss somebody off, I'm sure. <laughs> That's what we do around here, sir. <laughs> All right, Tealy. Tealy says I'm in a safe space. As a baby boomer um, with three very liberal daughters, two teachers, and one human rights lawyer, I'm uh, keenly aware of my own inbred ignorance from growing up in the 50s and 60s. And um, I would like to just say, you are a, a special person, and the ability you have to get your your life and, and the lives of so many others who have been afraid to come out, who have been afraid to be who they are and who they probably always have been. You do that with such grace and gratitude. Um, and I wanted to say thank you. And I think that anybody here that would want to um, invite Jason to have a cup of coffee, I think getting things done in small groups, uh, big groups, it's easy to listen and go, oh, yeah, I agree with that, and then walk away and never do it again. But when you sit down and you meet with people, and this is not only about the, the issues that you have tackled and taken on with your parents, with your mother, et cetera, et cetera. This also applies, and I know Shannon's probably going to knock me in the head, but this applies to race. Don't be complicit in what's going on. These are human beings, and I think Jason displays that he is a human being above all. And, you know, I'm at 68. I don't know how much longer I have, hopefully a few more years, but I'm not going down easy. So don't be complicit in this, you know, be, look at this guy, you know, he's as human as anybody I've ever seen or anybody I've ever listened to. So I just want to say that. Thank you. I'm not going to respond to that because you already know I don't have mascara on that to say. Um, I'll just say thank you for <laughs> We can all learn a thing or two from you. I, I just, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. That I think we can all agree on. <laughs> all right, I know you you got your your mic. I don't want to cut you out either. Um, so I'm I'm I guess I'm looking for something that's a little bit more specific in terms of what we can do. We're living in a world right now where the headlines and what you see in the news and everything is all the "Don't say gay" and um, no discussion allowed, and teachers getting fired for for you know bringing certain subjects up and and things like that, and and then. The flip side is this incident that just happened in Nashville um, that I think speaks to the, I think it speaks to a mental health issue. Um, and I'm just looking for something more specific that we can do to try to, to have an impact, make a difference. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would say is that if we are legally not allowed to have conversations in certain spaces, we are morally, ethically, and personally allowed to have those conversations anywhere that we so choose. Um, and making sure that we are 
having those conversations with the people in our personal circles and letting them know exactly like what you were saying is I grew up one way and I've learned. I became a bridge uh, and sharing that. It sounds silly, it sounds non-specific, but having an open dialogue and creating spaces where we can talk about this stuff is really, really important because then when it comes time for us to get in and vote, we'll remember that conversation we had with who we now know, and I have bragged on you since this, I, I, I continue to brag, that you now know what to call someone you love. Next time you walk in, you're going to remember her. We're all gonna remember that you have a, a, a title for that person that you love. Uh, and I think that's really important that we share and that we have that space. Um, that is the easiest thing I think we can do. And uh, there are a lot of harder things too, but again, that's what I talked about having bourbon for. So we'll talk about that for sure. Um, maybe time for one more. Um, and I think, I thought I saw a hand somewhere, maybe not. Great, we'll run back here. Uh, thank you, Jason, for um, your very enlightening, inspiring, motivational, really mind-changing presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I, I come across a friend of mine, very good friend of mine, uh, she just found out about uh, six months ago that her son, who was supposed to become a super duper scientist, a NASA engineer, um, came out and became transgender. And I remember the first phone call that I got from her, which was absolutely devastating. So uh, with that said, uh, I'm an ally to go ahead and try to build that bridge to help her get over the fear, I think, which is really more or less what's kind of causing this whole sort of uh, devastated feeling, which is very sad because it's a human still, it's her son, now daughter. Um, do, you, do you teach any workshops in Richmond? I will go anywhere that I need to oh, go. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to you. <laughs> so you know too back that's, there. That's Steve. Um, so. No, I th well, thank you for the, the chance to plug it too. Um, but uh, first of all, thank you for being an ally to um, that incredible woman and also her mom. Uh, I think a lot of times our um, aggression does come from fear and it comes from not knowing. And that's why having conversations like this is so important and remembering that we can be a bridge, but until someone is ready to cross that bridge, we just continue being that bridge, continue being there, building trust, sharing what we know, um, and allowing people the opportunity to safely become, in my opinion, a better person. Um, and I think that the best way to do that is, again, having trainings like this, having workshops like this, um, going to those resources we talked about. Uh, I will be back here in November. Between now and then, I got plenty of time. I'll head on down to Richmond. Um, but yeah, I, I will certainly be happy to come out to any any groups. Um, I, the last time I had several people say, could you come talk to this group that I'm part of or this group? The answer will always be yes. We will always find a way to keep this conversation going. Uh, and it's, it's much bigger than just an hour and a half seminar. Um, but thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you for welcoming me. Thanks for making me cry a little bit, which really isn't that big of a deal. Um, but, uh, but, but truly. It's not, it really is not. <laughs> uh, but thank you all so much, I, I do appreciate it. And if you ever have more questions that you wanna ask, you can scan that QR code on the right-hand side uh, and that'll take you to all my social media or my phone numbers there. Text me, call me, beat me if you wanna reach me. If you don't get that, that's because I'm of a different generation. Um, but anyway, thank you all so much and I'll chat with you soon. I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you to come up here now. Thank you. Well, uh, Jason, we really can't thank you enough. Uh, that was phenomenal. Um, we, uh, as he's mentioned, we, we're gonna have Jason back here on Thursday, November 9th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. here at the Hillsdale Conference Center. I apologize, I missed the uh, March GMM and I guess you all have pressured him enough to put the pictures of him in drag up there. So maybe uh, pressure him to Absolutely bring out not. the drag queen to do the next one. Ben is literally the <laughs> only person in the industry who wants me to come in drag. Yes. <laughs> Her name was Raina Bow. I mean, yes, I think uh, I think we need that next time.
I tell you what, if we uh, if we can get a comma and a booking fee, then <laughs> we'll talk about it. There's a price. There's a price for everything. Sorry, I didn't mean to take you off. No, that's your, that's your but uh, yeah, uh, please remind everybody for that next one. I, this was phenomenal to see so many people out. We would love to have even more for the next presentation that Jason does. Um, if you have not already done so, we do have our DEI library, or excuse me, uh, resources page on the website. Please visit that. It's got a ton of links, ton of information. Uh, it's on the main uh, login when you, you get into the MLS. Um, you can uh, review a, a variety of resources. Um, be mindful of uh, how you're growing, you're speaking, behaving, and treating each other. And we also have um, our DEI library. We've moved it out here in our pre function area for today. It can be found at any time in CAR. Um, and be, on uh, the behalf of the DEI Council, we hope that you will join us for Mobility, Inclusion, and Awareness Overview, which is going to be at the May General Membership Meeting. That is on Thursday, May 18th from 9 to 1030 in the morning here at the Hillsdale Conference Center. We will have guest speakers Joe Jameson, CEO and founder of Visit Able LLC, and Corey Paradis, the Chief Operations Officer at Visit Able LLC. They're going to join us to share ways that we can improve our disability awareness. Registration is free and available at the CAR Education and Events Calendar. That will also be in person and on Zoom for more options for you. And again, thank you for coming out, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.